introduction of our presenter. Uh, Christopher Gambino is an assistant professor of animal science at Delaware Valley University. His teaching focuses on livestock feeding and nutrition, organic livestock management, and the policies of aligning agriculture production with environmental outcomes. He received his doctorate in animal science from Washington State University, where he studied nitrogen cycles in dairy and beef systems. And he researched rumen microbial populations, fed nitrogen loss, and nitri nutrient loss from manure management strategies. He also holds a graduate certificate in sustainable agriculture from Washington State University. So Dr. Gambino, thank you so much for being here today. Um, and Alfred, if we can pass it over to him, that would be great. Yeah, Dr. Aaron. Gambino, welcome and go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, to DGA and PASA for having me here. I will be sharing my screen, so hopefully you can see the PowerPoint at this point in time. Uh, I recognize some of the names, so I'm glad that so many of y'all could join. It is uh, a beautiful day in Pennsylvania, where I'm located in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Uh, we are on stay-at-home order, so maybe that means more people join, or maybe that means people just get outside when it's sunny. I was asked to talk about some of my previous research and actually newer research that I hope to complete here in the coming year that um, Matt Baumgartner and myself kind of wrote for uh, a grant application to do this. So I'll dive into some background information and then talk a little bit more about kind of that research towards the end. All right, so quickly, I just wanted to kind of reiterate, I'm sure everyone as a dairy grazer or in the dairy industry is familiar, but we're talking about ruminants here with four chambers in the stomach. And the one we care pretty much the most about is that big old fermentation vat, the rumen, uh, often upwards in the mature cow of 42-ish gallons of a fermentation tank. And so we want to be able to utilize that as best as possible to convert cellulosic material into high quality milk. Okay, to talk a little bit about some more background, this slide's a little detailed, but the major emphasis is that we're gonna break down, or the animal's gonna break down feedstuffs, whatever they might be, into those microbes are going to break it down through microbial action and one of the end products of microbial action is going to be volatile fatty acids and this is going to be a major energy source for the mature ruminant and this is our goal is to make sure that rumen is functioning because that's where one the breakdown happens with bacteria and then two that's where the major site of volatile fatty acid absorption occurs so we need to get those volatile fatty acids from the rumen into the animal to then be utilized in terms of fatty acid synthesis to make our milk fats, in terms of glucose synthesis to make sugar that can be used in the body. All of that's going to happen in the rumen. Unfortunately, our dairy calves are not born functionate ruminants. They are actually what's talked about as pseudo monogastrics or pre-ruminants. And so at birth, our dairy calves abomasum, which is its true stomach, is about two times the size of the rumen. The rumen being the thing we really want to develop and function properly so that we that animal can break down cellulose and turn it into high quality milk. This is uh, imagery from a PSU extension but this same data can be found in several different publications. What it's showing is essentially at the first week of that calf's life, the comparative sizes of the rumen, reticulum, omasum, and abomasum. And then as that animal ages, so we're talking three to four months here or greater than 12 weeks, uh, it starts to turn closer to a functioning animal in terms of this, what the mature size would be. And then at maturity, the rumen is the major uh, percent of those four chambers. And this table down here just gives you those percentages. So this is the visual part, but this is the percentages. So at birth, 
upwards of 60% of the total stomach capacity, um, often measured uh, by tissue weight or by volume is the abomasum. And then as that animal matures, that starts to change in terms of proportions and the rumen becomes the dominant uh, physiological feature. And this is our goal is to transition that dairy calf, which is not a functioning ruminant yet to become a functioning ruminant so that it can break down and utilize cellulose. Okay, as it's born, it is a pseudo monogastric and so the rumen doesn't function. So one of the physiological aspects of this newborn dairy calf is what's called the esophageal groove. It's this groove right here that is right at the cardia, which is where the esophagus meets the four chambers. And when this animal suckles, it creates this channel down here that allows that milk in theory, or it could have been colostrum or it could be milk replacer to bypass the rumen uh, and then head into the omasum, but essentially just channel through the omasum into the abomasum, which would be the true stomach. And in that true stomach is where those immunoglobulins get uh, absorbed. It's where the protein in the milk gets broken down a little bit. And then all of that gets absorbed in the small intestines. So this is our dairy calf at birth. And this is why we're, it's evolved to drink milk. It suckles, it goes to the abomasum. Okay, but all of that means that there's nothing going into the rumen. And at the same time, if milk, liquid milk went into the rumen, it would kind of curdle and you'd have digestive issues. So we need to think about how do we move from this pre-monogastric or this pseudo-monogastric pre-ruminant into a functioning ruminant. And so for the four stomach to develop, there's several changes that are necessary. One of those changes is motility. So we need to strengthen the muscles of the rumen because that musculature causes for contractions to move digesta around the rumen, allowing bacteria to adhere to the feedstuffs, allowing passage of digesta to flow through the rumen, allowing volatile fatty acids to get outward towards the rumen wall because that's where they're absorbed from as well as that musculature allows for eructation. So we don't want that gas cap to build up. So that musculature needs to be strong enough to allow for that, that belching, that eructation. Size needs to change. And you saw the proportions of size change in the previous imagery where we went from kind of week one to 12 weeks to maturity. Papillae surface area needs to change. So at birth, they're barely present. Papillae are kind of the finger-like projections, the, the pieces within the rumen wall lining that allow for absorption of volatile fatty acids into the bloodstream. Okay, without them or without high functioning papillae, VFAs don't get absorbed into the animal and the animal can't utilize them. And so necessary to change from pre-ruminant to functioning ruminant is a need to have an increase in not just length, a lot of people measure length, but the length really is a, a function of surface area. So the longer that papilla gets, that means there's more surface area around it that can then absorb volatile fatty acids. Lastly, the establishment of a microbiome, meaning we need to establish a good bacterial population within that rumen. And as I hope to show, there's evidence in a, a recent review that talks about how important the establishment of this bacterial population is postnatal and at, at the weaning period. So this really needs to happy, happen early on. These microbes are, can come from the environment, they can come from feedstuffs, obviously they can come from mom, but these microbes need to be established early and when they are, they actually persist throughout adulthood. So we need to manipulate them early because they'll last through adulthood. Okay, I talked about the musculature and motility. I just want to provide another imagery here, but this is essentially the reason we need to focus on muscular and motility. And 
as you might guess, forages do this really well. So a, a forage diet, so say you had your calf, um, maybe you keep calf with mom, or maybe you start to introduce forages. The forages you introduce have an in, a, a larger particle size typically than the concentrates. And that large particle size does a really good job at increasing um, potentially rumen musculature and volume, but increase in musculature and volume are independent of epithelial development. And that epithelial development is the rumen wall, that lining, that papillae that we need that are necessary to absorb volatile fatty acids. Another component uh, that I mentioned that's necessary is papillae development. And I'm gonna talk about a couple pieces of information here, and then I'm gonna go into what's known as kind of the chemical stimulus theory and show you some early papers that provided evidence for that, and then newer research that changes that conversation slightly. So there is some evidence to show that dry feed uh, can increase the development of rumen papillae kind of around four weeks, and then by seven to eight weeks of life, have them fully formed and functioning. Uh, calves that were essentially fed to increase papillae development, so they're on a hay grain kind of base starter, fed that through 16 weeks of life, and then transitioned them to an all milk diet for the next four weeks of life, saw papillae decrease in length. And again, that associates with a decrease in surface area. So those papillae likely didn't have the same volatile fatty acid absorption capacity. Okay, which is why I want to bring to this point, um, and we can have this conversation towards the end, but keeping your calves on milk for extended periods of time can be detrimental to the development of the rumen, especially if they're suckling, because that milk is going to keep bypassing. And if you're not providing adequate uh, feedstuffs to stimulate fermentation in the rumen, then that rumen is not going to develop properly. And as you see here, there was some work done at Cornell and, and other places. And I'm sorry that I didn't provide the actual citation that lapsed my mind. I can get that to Aaron to post. But the four stomach, so we're talking the rumen here on an all liquid diet was smaller and the walls were thinner and the lining, meaning the papillae, were barely developed or not developed at all. So that's one of the, the consequences and one of the things that need to be thought about if you're going to continue to provide mainly a liquid-based diet uh, for an extensive period of time until weaning. And if you're going to have a, a later weaning date as a result, your rumen is going to be behind development. And we're really trying to transition that rumen to develop earlier because it's not functioning until we do. And we want to get it to develop earlier so that you can get that animal onto feeds, onto pasture, onto whatever forage-based diet you might want to put it on as dairy grazers so that that milk is then going into the bulk tank. So there's a twofold advantage to avoiding longer weaning dates, especially if you're not providing adequate forage and potentially a, a, a grain and we'll talk about that in a second. Because one, you're missing out on milk in the bulk tank. And two, you're really causing for an underdeveloped rumen. Okay, I mentioned volatile fatty acids, but I want to give a little bit more detail about what they are because they are crucial as we move forward to talk about kind of this chemical stimulus theory that I mentioned. So there's three major ones that most of you have probably heard in passing or are very familiar with. You've got acetic acid, also referred to as acetate in its salt form, propionic acid, and butyric acid. Okay, acetic acid ends up being the highest proportion on a molar basis in a forage-based diet, right? So those of you grazing and, and not including any grains in your ration are going to see, are, if you measure it a whole lot more, acetate or acetic acid production in the rumen as a volatile fatty acid compared to the other two. Okay, it is the least acidic of all, all the three of these. Um, 
its metabolism, and I'll talk a little about this in a later slide, ends up happening at the target tissues. It is utilized for some ATP generation, and so that's essentially chemical energy that the animal can use. And it's used as the basis for synthesis of short chain fatty acids. So we're talking things that you're interested in, in terms of milk fats. Propionic acid is seen is there's a shift between the ratio of acetic acid and propionic acid as you change the diet from forage based diet to a grain concentrate based diet. And so you see propionic acid increase in its proportion of the volatile fatty acids during that diet shift. Okay, it is more acetic than acetic or acidic than acetic acid. And what propionic acid is really, really happens with it is once it's absorbed through the papillae, through the rumen wall, into the bloodstream, it heads to the liver, and then the animal's liver converts it to new glucose. And then that glucose can be used to build some of the milk sugars. That glucose can be used for any other muscle cells in the body that need it for energy. That glucose can be used for the brain as energy. And then the last volatile fatty acid of the three is butyric acid. It's higher in a, a proportion in a concentrate diet, but it doesn't shift as readily as acetic and propionic acid. So those two shift a lot more readily than the others. Most, uh, it's the most acidic of the three acetic or the three volatile fatty acids. And it actually ends up being metabolized within the rumen wall to ketones. Okay, these are what they look like. So I'm just gonna show you that quickly. This is important because of how many carbons are associated with it. And that's going to be a point that I drive home later. Acetic acid is one, two carbons. Propionic is one, two, three carbons. And butyric is one, two, three, four carbons. Okay, now to the chemical stimulus theory. So this happened in the late 50s, early 60s. There's a bunch of papers. You could do stuff. Uh, I imagine Ian Cook was there, but... Uh, nowadays, you'd have to really sell the notion of feeding calves plastic sponges, but they did it. And so what this study was trying to establish was whether or not it was just bulk feed that impacted rumen development and papillae development, or if it was something else. So essentially, plastic is inert. Uh, even bacteria in the rumen can't break it down. So what they did was feed uh, uh plastic sponges as well as cellulosic sponges things that are made from carbon that can get broken down and they fed the salt form of the fatty acids so they fed butyrate propionate and acetate and and a bunch of different other dietary treatments that kind of were a combination of all of them and then they measured how much how how much of the mucosa what percentage of the four chambers was the rumen. They measured the tissue size of the other chambers, and they also measured the volume. And what they found was that plastic sponges, so something bulk that can't be fermented, did not have any impact. It did not cause for papillae development to occur. In opposition to that, the purified diets, so something that could get fermented and just feeding, uh, putting into the cannula of these calves, the fatty acid solutions, so the salt forms of the fatty acids, did in fact increase papillae development. And so what they ultimately stated was that the end products, so the metabolites of rumen fermentation, must be a stimulus for the rumen papillae to develop. Okay, they followed up this, uh, looking specifically at the different forms of the salt forms of the fatty acids, as well as feeding glucose and, and other uh, compounds like chloride and a controlled diet. Uh, similar type setting to dairy calves uh, that were cannulated. So they fed this through the cannula to the animal. And what they found was that the salt form of butyrate and propionate increased the rumen mucosa development. And so they decided that the growth was due to metabolism of these compounds and that they infect, they affect the rumen wall and blood flow. And if you recall, butyrate and propionate are essentially the, the volatile fatty acids that come from a shift in diet. So these end products come from a diet that is more grain concentrate based than forage based. 
And they showed that in comparison to acetate, which would be the acetic acid, which is the major end product from a forage-based diet, actually increased rumen development, whereas acetic acid did not. Okay, so the chemical stimulus theory essentially left us with this. And, and it's been shown over time as well, just not as interesting of experiments as what they did back in the late 50s, early 60s. That the, th the thinking is that because butyric acid and propionic acid are stronger acids than acetic acid, they, there's something about their acidic nature or the acidic uh, content of the rumen that has an influence, a greater influence on the development of the rumen wall, specifically the development of the papillae. And then that relates to the papillae's ability, because it has more surface area, to absorb volatile fatty acids better. And then those volatile fatty acids end up having an impact on the animal downstream. Okay, so that was late, 60, late 50s, early 60s. It's been replicated since, but we are in a new age with regard to technology. And so work out of Virginia Tech, and this is actually uh, the lab that myself uh, and the project that we just submitted for a grant would partner with in Virginia Tech to do the work I'll tell you about later, is using genes and looking at upregulation and downregulation of genes associated with volatile fatty acid absorption to understand the impact of diet. And so whereas the previous studies didn't, didn't really measure anything with regard to genes and absorption, they did measure kind of the loss of volatile fatty acids, which is a, a way to get an outcome of absorption. But now we're able to measure directly related to genes that we know are associated with volatile fatty acid absorption. And we can feed diets that we want to test and measure those, that, those gene differences in terms of whether or not they're on or off and, and how that impacts VFA absorption. So this is newer work coming out of Virginia Tech, and we hope to do something very similar. And I'll tell you about that towards the end. Okay, volatile fatty acids, why they're so important. I wanna just hammer this point home that you have the major three here. And essentially, they're, they're created differently in how they are provide energy efficiency to the animal. Uh, because of how many moles of glucose you can get out of them, which then results in a difference in calories per mole. And so when you convert that, you end up seeing that propionic acid is actually way more efficient in terms of its energy conversion for the animal than both butyric acid and acetic acid. This is another reason that trying to drive or at least manipulate the bacteria, the diet to manipulate the bacteria in the rumen to create the end product of propionate ends up with your animal, your, the diet you're feeding being more efficient in terms of energy conversion because propionic acid is higher efficiency and energy conversion than acetic and butyric acid. Okay, this is, a, I was told in my, when I was doing my doctoral work never to show convoluted slides, but this one's super important to follow the flow of volatile fatty acids. And so we're in the rumen, and depending on what you're feeding, you get butyrate, you get acetate, you get propionate. They get shuttled through the rumen wall except for butyrate. It's metabolized within the rumen wall to ketones. And then the ketones get shuttled into the blood elsewhere in the body. So you follow the ketones, the acetate, the propionate through the bloodstream. Okay. Propionate makes it to the liver. And as I said, it gets almost completely converted to glucose. That glucose can then go to other places in the body. Specifically, it can end up in the mammary tissue that allows it to get converted to either glycerol to help create those short chain fatty acids or to lactose, our milk sugar. Okay, whereas acetate formed in the rumen goes through the wall, it doesn't really get converted in the liver at all. It continues on to tissues to have its impact. And as we see, acetate ends up flowing into the mammary gland and that acetate then gets converted into our short chain fatty acids, our milk fats. Ketones, likewise, get converted. They can be used all over the body. Those ketones also end up in the mammary gland, and they, too, get converted uh, into fatty acids. 
some of the times those ketones end up being converted into longer chain fatty acids. So this is just to show you why VFAs are so important, why manipulating the diet to change the bacteria in the rumen is so important because of the impact volatile fatty acids can have on our milk production. Sorry for that slip ahead. Okay, so this is just to show you kind of the fatty acids. I'm not gonna belabor the point. The slide deck will be up, but you're familiar with some of the fatty acids you're after within your milk. And this is just to show you the level of fatty acids. Uh, acetate ends up converting about like eight, eight acetates or eight moles, because they're not essentially numbers, to one palmitic acid. So you go from one acetate to or eight acetates to one of these because there's six carbons here and acetate's got two carbons. Okay, I want to talk quickly about carbon and energy flow because this is another point to make with regard to why we want to focus on a diet that might be driving the rumen. So to change that non-functioning rumen to a functioning rumen that can then utilize um, particularly a diet that creates more propionate or butyrate. Okay, this is kind of energy flow. A lot of you are familiar with your net energy of lactation, right? That's what you're after when you're kind of looking at your feed reports. You want to be able to produce more milk. So you want a, a feed, a diet that's got a high net energy lactation value. Okay, but part of what we lose when we're feeding is this gas loss. And essentially, this is what we lose it to. So we lose it to carbon dioxide and methane. When you're feeding this animal, and it's rumen's development, developing. You, have, you can create a microbial population that ends up creating acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And if you remember, acetate's two carbons, propionate's three carbons, and butyrate is four carbons long. Your feed is full of carbons, okay? That's what ends up being the energy value. That's what the microbes break apart and turn into microbial cells that then release acetate, butyrate, and propionate. Methane is carbon-based. If we are driving a diet to produce or to create an environment for bacteria to produce more end products of propionate and butyrate, that means we're producing three carbons and four carbons. So that's three carbons and four carbons coming from the carbon that you just fed. So you paid big bucks to create a ration that's got carbon in it to be utilized by the microbes and the animal you generate a diet that creates an environment. So you have three and four carbon volatile fatty acids. That means there's less carbon available to turn into methane. And so you're losing less of your fed resources to methane by driving a diet to create propionate and butyrate. Whereas if your diet is driving mostly the production of acetate, that's only two carbons. That leaves a whole lot more carbons and the environment actually uh, is a thriving environment for methanogens to then steal that carbon that you just fed as methane that ends up getting eructated out and lost. So methane, yes, has an environmental impact. It's talked about with regard to greenhouse gas emissions, but ultimately it is an energy loss for you. And then in terms of how the volatile fatty acids act with regard to changing the pH of the rumen, butyrate and propionate are more acidic than acetate. And it turns out that methanogens don't really thrive well in more acidic conditions. So as you start to shift the rumen pH more acidic, you start to lose some of your methanogen population, meaning you're not converting as much of your carbons into methane and not losing as much energy. Okay, so some review, and this is brand new review, uh, 2019, and I want to point out uh, the resource down at the bottom. I will provide an appendix and, and hand it over to Aaron with a bunch of these uh, paper titles and resources and maybe even link them so you can go grab them if you want. But of the, all the research they reviewed in this 2019 review, they found four major points that point us back to the importance of us manipulating the diet when that calf is postnatal and at the weaning period. So they found that an early feeding regime and nutrition has huge impacts on ruminant development and the establishment of rumen microbiota, which means the rumen kind of uh, bacterial population. 
They also, based on all the papers they reviewed, saw that this impact, so this population then persists for a long time and can impact the lifetime of the productive performance and health of the adult ruminant. So we're not just talking about changing the bacteria population in the calf, that population actually then persists into adulthood. And then similarly, they pointed out the most important and sensitive time to do so, that window of opportunity is at the postnatal period or the weaning period. So we're talking starter diets. This is exactly what that's pointing to. And then within that kind of the rumen as it develops and becomes colonized with bacterial population becomes the place where that transition, so this establishment of bacterial population fosters that transition from pre-ruminant pseudomonogastric to a functioning ruminant because now like those earlier studies showed that when you have the bacterial population you're able to ferment your feedstuffs and that fermentation ends up being the stimulus for the papillae development so the takeaway is because of the grain-based or a high energy based diet that's readily fermentable carbohydrate so we're talking something that's gonna ferment quickly upon it being consumed and drive that pH of the rumen down, these diets are essentially usually end up being grain-based. Not to say that other diets can't be designed, it's just that they haven't been. We haven't designed a readily fermentable carbohydrate diet that isn't a grain. And so the starters are end up being grain-based and they can be the best because one, you can change the particle size so we can still get that musculature and mobility impact that the forage provides. But what we can get with something that's a higher concentrate, higher uh, density and more readily fermentable carbohydrate starter is things that the forage can't provide, um, the stimulation of the epithelial development. And we still don't exactly know whether or not it's the pH change in the rumen, whether it's the butyric acid itself, whether it's something that the butyric acid generates in the rumen wall that changes genes. We're still working on exactly what it is, but it's starting to seem that it's less just the fact that it's pH and more about something to do with those volatile fatty acids that changes the gene regulations in the rumen epithelium. So that's like, that's the major takeaway. And then I wanted to pause for the next steps that Aaron had mentioned. So I'm really interested to see if there is an alternative. Uh, we have the dairy grazer apprentice, grazing apprenticeship. We have kind of organic valleys grass fed milk program and they're changing kind of their, their uh, criteria for how to be involved and what kind of, what can in, be included in that diet. And so, I wrote uh, a grant with, uh, with, with, along with Matt as a sponsor to look at dairy calves. We're going to hopefully, if we get funded, do this research at Delaware Valley University, which when I come back on screen, you can see our dairy as my virtual background. But we're going to look at three different diets. We're going to first design a, a novel forage-based starter because it doesn't exist. And we're going to look at a combination of forages and we're going to test those uh, using a bunch of different feed analyses to see which one would stimulate the rumen uh, VFA population the most. Then we're going to compare that novel-based forage starter to your traditional or an organic grain-based forage starter or grain-based starter and compare that to an all-liquid milk diet. So we're going to design a forage-based starter and we're going to compare it to your tr traditional grain-based starter and an all-milk diet. And we're going to investigate the, with the newer technology. So we'll use old technology looking at papillae length, tissue weight, uh, measure papillae surface area. But we're also going to partner with the Virginia Tech Lab to do the more novel analyses of looking at the VFA transporters and the gene regulation associated with them. And so our hope is to show which of these is ends up being a, the best diet to kind of transition our dairy calf from pre-ruminant pseudomonogastric to a functioning ruminant quicker so that y'all could get more milk back into your bulk tank and have a healthy, uh, fully functioning ruminant early on. And so with that kind of breadth of information, 
I know I wanted to leave a bunch of time for questions. And so that's kind of what I'm going to turn it over to now. And I will stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you so much for that, Chris. Um, received a couple questions. People can uh, continue to post on the chat board. The first one I had was, uh, why do animals do well in a cow-calf system fed no grain? That was an observation from one of our farm grazers out there. So if we're talking kind of the beef cow calf system, our, our goals are slightly different. So it's not that your, your calf can't end up doing well if it's out there getting milk from mom and learning how to graze from mom, but the extent of how long that takes, right? Those six to eight months, and we're not really measuring the room and development through that time period of the cow calf operation. We can, uh, I haven't seen a study that has essentially looked at it at six weeks versus the six to eight months that that calf would then kind of wean off mom. So it's not that it doesn't do well. It's not that your calf can't do well, but do you want your calf to be on mom six to eight months out of the year missing that much milk in your bulk tank? So it, it can do well and you can have that system, but it's not the optimal system. That answer your question, Alfred. You posed. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The we had um, one here. How efficient is the gastric groove at shunting milk to the abomasum, and how much does that vary? So the how efficient is it? So there's some leakage, and there's also a, a, often regurgitation back from the abomasum into the rumen but it's pretty efficient at suckling and it can actually persist for a longer period of time. If you remain, if that animal remains suckling past uh, kind of normal weaning periods. So uh, it, it, there's some leakage, but I don't know if there's ever been a percentage measure. Most of it does flow through into the omasum directly into the abomasum. If a grass-fed farmer does not want to feed grain, what is the best thing for them to do to improve rumen development? That, that's what we're hoping to work on with this grant. I, I don't know that I've seen anyone try to design something to compare to the level that a, a, a readily fermentable carbohydrate like a grain can do in developing the rumen papillae. And so the fact that I haven't seen it means maybe it's time to start looking at that as we have more and more producers try to go this route of being dairy grazers. Uh, if you think about it, I mean, one of the reasons we probably haven't seen it is most of our milk is coming from the traditional mechanisms and traditional design of a dairy. Uh, so most of our research dollars have been pointed in that direction because those essentially were the populations that needed the research the most and then think about kind of how long it would take to do all the research with the dollar so we can do rumen development studies within and, and they're still pretty costly within kind of an eight to 12 week period but what we proposed as if we get funded this round what phase two would be is what you really care about, right? It's not just the rumen development, but is that replacement heifer then going to produce well? And so you really need to take the study out to that first lactation. So that's an extensive period of time and that it involves a lot of research dollars. So that's my guess as to why we haven't seen it and that's why we're going to do it. And then when we do it, I can provide you much more evidence-based information about what that best diet would be. Great. Well, we're going to keep going here. I appreciate you being able to take, being able to take these questions on the fly. Uh, what are your thoughts on difference from hay versus grazing? Anecdotally, grazing provides an advantage. Do you think this may be due to our hays being poor, or is there something about fresh grass? Uh, anecdotally, I, I would meaning for the for the calf or for the cow are we talking milk production or are we talking kind of mm -hmm. gain on gain on the replacement heifer well, this one came from megan hayne megan do you want to she's talking about calf 
Okay. Uh, I am not sure what it, what that would relate to. If there's going to be a little bit more, uh, depending on when the hay is getting harvested, right? That, so hay is, is, uh, if you're getting a, a feed, a, a feed report on your hay, you can kind of compare it to when you send in a fresh sample and, and decide what that, those soluble sugars look like and what the kind of digestibility, the NDF 30 looks like. And if they are similar, then I'm not, I'm at a loss, but my guess is that they're not as similar as what that pasture is when that animal is out on pasture. Um, so I, I think it goes to your latter point that your haze might be slightly different in terms of what they're providing <coughs> as fermentable carbohydrates versus what that animal is getting when it's grazing out on pasture. Do you advocate pre-choice apple cider vinegar to supplement rumen development? Uh, I am on the fence, so I don't, I don't sit one way or the other. I have not read enough in the literature to say this is a good idea or this is a bad idea. Um, anecdotally, I think most people uh, or, or people that I know do it. But I, I, I'm going to sit on the fence on this one because I haven't read enough saying yay or nay. Fair enough. Here's one from Dr. Dr. Sylvia. Thanks for the information shared. We know that pH is the driver of the availability of hydrogen ions in the rumen, and that indirectly changes the bacteria population in the rumen. Are you planning to monitor the pH changes to explain which subset of bacteria is favored? In the study we we're doing, we are not going to monitor the pH one because we don't have the funding to cannulate them, which is the easiest way to pull a sample and get the room and pH. Um, but we are, we're going to, in, in terms of this study, we're actually just going to look at the, what the end rumen looks like at slaughter and what the pili length surface areas and the the gene differences in terms of up and down regulation so we won't be able to say specifically which populations were there um we could in theory although it, it wasn't planned and submitted pull the room and fluid at slaughter and get a pop and then and then sample that for kind of 16 srna to get whatever the population is there um that would be our closest thing to do but right now we did not design it to do that well, that's an interesting idea what, what sort of forages are you considering for your research legumes grasses a blend uh i'm hesitant to say Right now, I will tell you one that is on the top of my mind. We are thinking about kind of keeping with the sustainable theme and using some processed, uh, some byproducts of a particular industry that's thriving in Pennsylvania and other states um, to keep it vague because I'm not, yeah, yeah. I will 100% I will share if and when we get funded. But until that point, I think we're going to keep it under under radar. All right. And to your knowledge, has anyone looked at rumen contents of developing beef calves to ascertain if there's some milk mixed in with a forage, milk that could provide fermentable substrate for rumen development? Did you read that, read that one again? Yeah, and it's in the chat string. Um, has anyone looked at rumen contents of developing beef calves to ascertain if there's some milk mixed in with the forage, milk that could provide fermentable substrate for rumen development. Okay, so the, the question I think if I'm getting is asking, is some of the beef calf that's suckling on its mom, is some of that milk leaking into the rumen that ends up being fermentable carbohydrate? That's how I understand it. Okay, uh, I don't know if anyone's looked at it and it could, I mean, it, they, it does kind of go back a little bit. So those sphincters aren't as tight, those openings. So it does regurgitate a little bit back up. But my guess is that it's, it's not going to be a, a huge source of fermentable carbohydrate 
in, within that developing beef calf that that is going to be shunted into the abomasum and that is going to end up being directly broken down in the abomasum and those those peptide chains and those amino acids are going to be absorbed in the small intestine and that glute or that lactose is going to get broken down and absorbed in the small intestine as well and not necessarily a huge proportion of it be sh show up in the rumen so I, I don't i my guess i haven't seen anything so that answers one and my guess is that it's it's not a huge proportion that ends up showing up in the rumen okay we had um Dr. Sylvia asked, are you comfortable with the length of time to check on the rumen development? Comfortable in the length of time. With the length of time to check on the rumen development. I'm guessing she's referring to the study you're proposing. Uh, the length of time we are proposing. So because of I, I, funding, I, what I wanted to do was uh, to do a six week and an eight week, um, very similar to the protocol that Virginia Tech used in their newest uh, set of studies that is looking at the gene regulation. Uh, we only ended up proposing a single week and, or single time point, and off the top of my head, I forget if we chose six weeks or eight weeks. So we're going to compare a, a single time point. Uh, in theory, I would have liked to have two time points with two calves in each dietary treatment at those two time points. Instead, we'll have four calves in each dietary treatment at one time point. So that's going to be six ish around six or eight weeks is the time point. Am I comfortable with that? Uh, yes, obviously I'd like to be able to compare earlier and later times, but due to constraints, we had to design it for kind of what's the average and optimal time. So that's, that's kind of where we are. But to note, one of the things we are going to do, which I is, is more novel than what I've seen elsewhere, is we are going to use an ultrasound to, that has been proven to be able to look at rumen mucosal thickness uh, without being invasive. And so we'll, through that time period, we'll be measuring the rumen mucosal thickness, and then we can compare those measurements to what we find at slaughter with regard to all of the papillae, the mucosa development, the tissue weight, the papillae length and surface area, so that if we end up doing phase two and growing the replacement heifers out two years to um, get them to first lactation, we can we don't have to slaughter them to look at tissue area uh, to look at anything to do with papillae development we can then compare to what hopefully we had correlated between uh, rumen mucosal development or rumen mucosal thickness with the ultrasound to what we actually measured so that's our end goal is in terms of a longer time period to be able to correlate rumen thickness with an ultrasound to what we find at slaughter within this study Okay, we're going to do one more, Chris, and, and then I'll let uh, uh, Alfred post the survey. And, and thank you so much again for your time. Yeah. Um, there was a, a comment from Michael Munthy, uh, soft and tender grass hay with the least to no legume content harvested during vegetative stage may be best way for no grain calves to develop rumens early. I wanted to just note that comment. And then another, I've had a couple questions uh, come in privately and beforehand around the role genetics might play. Um, do you think that, are you looking at different genetics in terms of rumen development, or do you think that could be a significant role that some breeds might actually uh, examine, examine different development based on forage diets? Uh, I think genetics play a huge role. So uh, in, in several different ways. Uh, I do think environment and diet play enormous roles as well in terms of establishing the microbial population, which is, which is probably one of the most important aspects of what we're doing in rumen development, as well as kind of changing the end products for the animal to be able to use. And so environment's huge in that Diet's huge in that for the microbes, but genetics does play a, a large factor in that. Uh, I was thinking about it earlier because of the notion uh, of 
kind of resorting back to letting cow and calf reside together and graze together and how that might be more of a natural system. And I, I think some of that is true, but I think we, in terms of how we bred and change genetics, nature would not necessarily have had a 50 pound per day milk cow or 70 to 80 pound per day milk cow. So I think the way that we've domesticated and changed the, the genetics over time for really good, really high producing or really high quality producing milk cows uh, changes what we might be thinking about how we have to interact and engage with helping and guiding through diet the transition from pre-ruminant or pseudomonogastric to functioning ruminant. And so I think that the genetic factors there are going to play into that. I haven't looked specifically at what different breeds genetics look like and if there's heritability within the time frame of transition from pre to functioning ruminant. And that might be something very interesting to look at. Okay, well, thank you again, Chris. I really appreciate you yeah, taking thanks, the time today. Um, and you can follow up with me with any resources you want to share with the group. Excellent. Um, Alfred, do yeah. um, you want to share the survey? Yeah, I will share the survey and ask everybody that's on the computer to please fill it out. It just should just take a couple seconds. But you can continue the discussion while that's going on. Well, do you want to take one more, Chris? Sure, I'll sit here for another. Uh, do you think a rumen developed without grain would be better adapted to a no grain diet once they calve and begin to milk? That's a great question and one that I, I'm wrestling with and hope to find in phase two if we get the funding. Uh, I have not looked at specific research with that regard, but the the major point of the development and the transition from pseudo ruminant to functioning ruminant is about the papillae's ability to have a, a greater surface area and absorption and upregulation. Uh, I noted that if you feed an all milk diet or all liquid diet, you can lose that. I don't think, uh, and this is just conjecture, that if you transition from kind of creating and establishing that functional ruminant early, to then more of or an all uh, forage based diet that you will see that same loss in absorption that you see when you go to an all milk based diet. So I think that you can create the functioning ruminant and then that functioning persists when transitioning. You wouldn't see the loss you'd see in an all milk diet. Now, you will change the bacterial population. There's no doubt about that going from introducing uh, a, a starter diet that might have grains in it to transitioning that animal to just a, a forage-based diet. You'll change the population, but I don't, this is conjecture again, I don't know if I've read anything of, in this regard, that you will substantially change the surface area of the papillae once they're developed in that nature because you're still going to have uh, fermentation going on so it's still going to be stimulated with fermentation and you're still going to have the physical nature to increase the musculature to move those VFAs around with the forage and the diet. So it's not going to look the same as the all milk. Uh, so I think you can get away with starting with a grain-based diet and transitioning to a forage-based system. That transition is going to not be immediate, right? We're gonna, it's going to have to be kind of phased uh, to allow the bacteria to shift, but I think you can get away with it. And it might actually help the, the animal in time in terms of complete room and development. Yeah. One of the, I mean, one of the major points of, of getting the rumen to function earlier and fully establishing those papillae and actually increasing the absorption capacity of the papillae, which is something that the grain based diet does that I'm, I might've neglected to mention the, when you have the butyrate and the propionate is actually creates for a greater absorption rate within the papillae that if you, if you're not, a, if you, if you use kind of a, a mixed ration, you end up seeing better animal health overall because you decrease your incidence of subacute ruminal acidosis 
because you don't have that asset buildup in the rumen because it's able to absorb across the rumen more. So it doesn't build up because it can absorb. Now, those of you who are going to be on pasture, that, that doesn't really matter to you, but you can, we can see some animal health benefits by early on manipulating the diet so that we can increase the absorption capacity of VFAs so that they're not, you're not sticking around with acids stuck in that rumen that on a higher concentrate diet would, would lead to SARA. Well, thanks again, Chris. And thanks everybody for joining today. Very interesting conversation and uh, wish everybody a good day. And thank you, Alfred and DJ for, for hosting us.